Hi, I'm Warren Sprouse. This is the Bible Forum. We're here every Sunday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. We just look at life through a biblical lens. There's something that's been bothering me uh, for several years now. Uh, it just kind of came to a head this week uh, when our president, uh, President Obama, went to a Muslim mosque in Baltimore. He just did this this past week. We're talking about February 3rd, 2016. A couple days later, he went to a, a prayer breakfast in, in Washington. And, and in both cases, he, he sought to offer support uh, and also praise for Muslims everywhere. Uh, in his words, in his speech, uh, he embraced mum, Muslims in the United States as part of, as he called it, one American family, and implicitly criticized the Republican presidential candidates in a warning to citizens not to be bystanders to bigotry. And he said in part, quote, and so if we're serious about freedom and of religion, and I'm speaking now to my fellow Christians who remain in the majority in this country. We have to understand an attack on one faith is an attack on all our faiths. Now, I'm not anti-Muslim. I don't go around looking for people that look like they don't belong. You know, there may be Middle Easterns, oh, it's a Muslim. I don't blame every Muslim for what's going on in the world. It's not like that at all. But they're Muslims who are doing this. And in the interest of fairness, uh, I got some questions. Uh, what is it that it constitutes an attack against Muslims? And what sort of an attack against Muslims existed in this country, at least, before 9-11? How many masked Christian shooters have sought out non-Muslims merely to kill them in horrific, terroristic ways? And how many Christians are leaving home seeking asylum or citizenship in Muslim countries for no reason other than to terrorize them and ultimately murder them if they can? America and Americans take a lot of abuse from people all over the world simply for being Christian or for being an American. The fact that in the history of these United States, a precious few, in terms of percentage, have been and are true Bible Christians is really lost on even the American press and public. The fact that Americans bought slaves to work the fields, largely in the South, is viewed as a national sin, a national sin that we all have to atone for over and over and over again. The fact that the slaves purchased in the colonies represents a very small percentage of the total slaves bought and sold during that time period that the buyers represented a very small percentage of the total population of those colonies, and that those who did so were really operating counter to Christian teaching. None of these points ever enters into a discussion. But then we all understand that facts are pesky little things. And we don't never want to let facts get in the way of what we believe or what we say. Now today, there are slaves in this world. They're bought and sold. Back then, in the 16th, 17th century, there were millions of Africans who were captured and then sold as slaves. We're told that upwards of 11 million of these were transported across the Atlantic. And the discourse tends to stop there with the implication that we got 11 million of these people. 
But the facts are pesky. Uh, it's estimated that only 5% of the estimated 11 million that came across the Atlantic actually came to this country. And none of those were sold into sexual slavery. You say, what's that got to do? We'll come back to that. At the same period in time, 28 million were sent to the Middle East. And out of that 28 million, 80% are estimated to have died en route. Of those that came over here, it's estimated that maybe 10% died in the passage. 80% of 28 million is a whole lot more than 10% of 5%. One is too many. But my question is, why are 21st century black Americans enamored of Islam? And why is it that American Christians, who basically stood against this, are vilified as slave owners? Now, now you know how it works. It works that way today. If somebody stands out, I'm a Christian, then they are. No, they're not. Christian is as Christian does. But let me let you rummage around with some other facts. Here, I want you to consider just a little bit of history. A lot has been written regarding this transatlantic slave trade. But surprisingly little attention has been given to the Islamic slave trade across the Sahara, across the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean. While the European involvement in transatlantic slave trade to the Americas lasted just over 300 years, the Arab involvement in African slave trade had been going on for 600 years prior to that. And that Muslim slave trading is still going on. It's been going on for 1,400 years in some parts of the Muslim world. It was Muslims who were selling the Africans into slavery all through the Caribbean, South America, Central America, Europe, Asia, the Middle East, long before they ever came here to the colonies. Two out of every three slaves shipped across the Atlantic were men. The proportions are reversed in terms of slaves sent to the Muslim world. Two women for every man were enslaved by a Muslim. It's estimated that possibly as many as 11 million Africans were transported across the Atlantic. 95% of them went someplace else. Only 5% came here. Now, the mortality rate for slaves being transported across the Atlantic was as high as 10%. The percentage of slaves dying in transit other places was 80 and 90. Now, while almost all the slaves shipped across the Atlantic were for agricultural work, most of the slaves destined for the Muslim Middle East were for sexual exploitation, concubines, harems, and even for military service, not the women, but you know, the guys that showed up. Many children were born to slaves in the Americas, and millions of their descendants are citizens in Brazil and the United States to this very day. Very few descendants of the slaves that ended up in the Middle East actually survived. These are horrendous comparisons and statistics. If one slave is bought and sold, if one, I should say one human being is sold as a slave, it's a horrendous process. 
if one dies, one is exploited. We're talking millions. Most of the slaves that came here to the Americas, whole Western Hemisphere, could marry. They could have families. In the Middle East, the male slaves, most of which, as they showed up in the Middle East, either were castrated before they got there or afterwards. And if there were children born to the women who were slaves, those children were generally killed at birth. They didn't want these people. Of the 28 plus million Africans enslaved in the middle uh, Muslim Middle East, at least 80% were calculated to have died. It's believed that the death toll from the 14 centuries of Muslim slave raids into Africa could have been well over 112 million people. Add that to the number of people sold in the slave markets and the total number of African victims, black men and women. Total, some estimates are as high as 140 million people. Did I tell you it's still going on? Do you not understand that it was Christians in this country who spearheaded the anti-slavery abolitionist movements here and in Europe? Great Britain mobilized her navy throughout most of the 19th century to intercept slave ships and set the captives free. During the same period, and even now, there's been no comparable opposition to slavery in the Muslim world. Great Britain outlawed the slave trade in 1807. Europe abolished slave trade in 1815. While this was going on, Muslim slave traders enslaved a further two million Africans. All of that despite the vigorous British naval activity and military intervention. By some calculations, the number of victims over the whole 1,400 years could exceed 180 million human beings. And the black population of America embraces Islam and generally rejects anything they deem exclusively white. In 1835, Great Britain set their slaves free. In 1865, U.S. law set slaves free. Yet in Saudi Arabia and Yemen, begrudgingly, these nations removed legalized slavery from their statute books in 1962. It doesn't mean they're not doing it. And this was only because of international pressure that was brought to bear, political economic pressure. Today, there are numerous international organizations that document slavery, and they tell us that this is continuing to occur in some Muslim countries. In Christian belief, we have a Bible. The Old Testament provided for slavery, and everybody seems to know that. But what they don't understand or don't care to understand is that it provided for slavery for criminals and for insolvent debtors. Kidnapping? enslaving law-abiding people came under the, 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 um, the penalty of death in the Old Testament canon, the Old Testament law. Exodus chapter 21, anyone who kidnaps another and either sells him or still has him when he is caught must be put to death. 
That sounds like the Bible supports slavery. Indentured servanthood? Yeah. Criminals? They didn't have jails. You had two choices. You kill them, or you make them slaves. They pay back with their life. The New Testament expressly forbids both the slave trade and slavery itself. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, adulterers, perverts, for slave traders and liars, for perjurers. That's what the law is about. That's why we have laws. What he's saying is that the Christian doesn't need those laws because they wouldn't do this stuff. It's not in their heart to do it. Later, the same apostle in Galatians chapter 3 wrote, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're all one. A Christian doesn't have a slave. They might have a brother in the Lord who's working for them as an indentured servant. And even today, yeah, you don't have to come and live in my house I don't get to say where you go and what you do, but if you owe me, you're still my slave. Proverbs, the debtor is slave to the one who has loaned him the money. Can't just do what you want. It's a form of slavery. The scriptural commands to love our neighbor, to be a good Samaritan, to do for others what you would want them to do for you. Stand above our churches. Christians like William Wilberforce in Great Britain, John Newton, who was a slaver at one point, William Carey, David Livingston, Lord Shaftesbury, you never heard of, General Charles Gordon, and many, many more work tirelessly to end the slave trade, to stop child labor, to set the captives free. It's what Christians do. The history of the church from the second century is shown to be against slavery of any kind. During the second and third centuries, many tens of thousands of slaves were freed by people and people groups who had converted to Christ. St. Melania was said to have emancipated 8,000 slaves. St. Ovidius freed 5,000. Chromatius freed 1,400. Hermes, 1,200. Many of the Christian clergy at Hippo, which is North Africa, under St. Augustine, freed their slaves as an act of piety, he said. In 315 AD, the Emperor Constantine, just two years after he issued the Edict of Milan, legalizing Christianity, imposed a death penalty on those who stole children to bring them up as slaves. Later on, the Emperor Justinian abolished all laws that prevented the freeing of slaves. St. Augustine saw slavery as the product of sin and as contrary to God's divine plan. He wrote about it in the city of God. Chrysostom in the fourth century taught that when Christ came, he annulled slavery. He proclaimed, quote, in Christ Jesus, there is no slave. Therefore, it's not necessary to have a slave by them. And after you have taught them some skill by which they can maintain themselves, set them free. Unnecessary. For centuries throughout the Middle Ages, bishops and church councils recommended the redemption of captive slaves. And for 500 years, the Trinitarian monks redeemed Christian slaves from the Moorish, read Muslim, servitude. In 1102 AD, the London Church Council outlawed slavery and the slave trade. By the 12th century, slaves in Europe were rare. And by the 14th century, slavery was almost unknown on the continent of Europe. But in the midst of all of this came Islam, around 700 AD. And with Islam, there was a rebirth of slave trading. 
Ronald Segal writes in a book, Islam's Black Slaves, he documents, quote, when Islam conquered the Persian Empire much of, and much of the Byzantine Empire, including Syria and Egypt in the 7th century, that's 800s, it acquired immense qualities of gold. And it did so by stripping churches and monasteries, either directly or by taxes, payable in gold, imposed on the clergy, and looting gold from tombs, and state encouraged a search and sanction of seizure in return for a fifth of whatever they could find. He goes on to note that female slaves were required in considerable numbers for musicians, singers, and dancers. Many more were bought for domestic workers, and many were in demand as concubines. The harems of rulers could be enormous. The harem of, of Abd al-Rahman, 912 to 961, in Cordoba, Spain, contained over 6,000 concubines. And the one in the, in, in the uh, Fatimid palace in Cairo had twice that many. It's interesting that while 5% of all the transatlantic slaves ended up in North America, the vast majority of the films of this world, the books and the articles concerning the slave trade, concentrate only on American involvement in the slave trade during this one sliver, large sliver, but a sliver of, of human history as though slavery was a uniquely American aberration and that it went on forever and ever and they didn't want to give it up and this, that, and the other. But the vastly greater involvement of Portugal, Spain, France, largely ignored. Even more so, the far greater and longer-running Muslim slave trade into the Middle East that has been ignored. It is today one of history's best kept secrets. So it wonders me why so many black Americans embrace Islam because it empowers them and it makes them free and it gives them worth and condemns what they consider to be Christian America. They go and they stand with their own slave masters, with the men and women who bought and sold them and sent them over here. Men and women and children who died by the millions all over Africa for hundreds of years. But black history is important. And their heritage as Africans is important. Well, my friends, that's part of your heritage. Why are you embracing these people, this religious system? It has never done you any good. And the president, he goes over to Africa a few years back, and he stands in the door of no return. He and his wife, gazing out across the Atlantic from the western shores of Africa, thinking about all of his ancestors who went through that door. And never once allowing for the fact that it was Muslims who did that. Blame the guys that bought them. Blame the guys that transported them. Don't ever blame the guys that captured them, tortured them, starved them, abused them, and sold them, and are still doing it today. That's a form of insanity. But it's our 21st American insanity, isn't it? And there are many more like it. Amazing.